they get some sort of input, think about it, and then spit out an output. The little brain then checks, hey, is the output I've given them correct? If it's not correct, it takes these mistakes and it learns from them. So it doesn't make the mistake, the same mistake again the next time. It's like when you're you know, wandering around the shops and you smell something really nice, say like cinnamon scrolls. You're like, oh yes, I love cinnamon scrolls. I'm finally going to eat so many of them. Then you go find the source of smell, and it's actually a candle. And you just, you're just disappointed, right? <laughs> and your brain learns. And your brain's like, oh, that was a really disappointing experience. I'm going to learn from that and not do it again. So we teach these little brains by showing them lots of examples of stuff that we want them to learn. If we wanted this neural network to help us with the triangle and square problem that I mentioned earlier, like our small cousin, we'd probably just show the neural network lots of examples of what is a triangle and what isn't. This lets the little brain learn what makes a triangle a triangle. Here are some different neural networks, and um, there are many variants of these neural networks because we can arrange them in specific configurations and put special restrictions on them such that they behave or think in different ways. This is why we're able to apply neural networks to so many problems. So this brings us to the deep part of the talk, and believe it or not, it's like the simplest part of my talk today. <laughs> So neural networks have their neurons arranged in layers, like so. As you can see here, the first layer has two neurons, the second layer has four, and the third layer has three. When we talk about deep learning, all we're talking about is a neural network with lots of neurons in it. And the more layers a neural network has, the more it is able to represent complex ideas. That's what the deep part of deep learning means. Deep learning means it's like how the instruction manual printed on a single A4 sheet of paper can really explain so much. If you had more pages, or if the piece of paper was bigger, you can just put so much more information, so many more ideas on it. Now that we've wrapped up around what networks are and what deep learning kind of is, let's have a look at how we use these things in everyday life. And believe me, these neural network things will pop up everywhere. So I'm going to talk about three kinds of technology that utilize deep learning in everyday life. That is recommendation, computer vision, and playing games. So this is an actual recommendation that I think iTunes threw up about 10 years ago. If you like Britney Spears, you might like the report on pre-war intelligence. <laughs> now, we've come a long way since these really bad recommendations. Spotify and Netflix are known for their excellent recommendation systems, and the algorithms that power these systems actually crunch through mountains of data every day in order be, to be able to provide you with such good recommendations. So both Spotify and Netflix use this technique called item-based collaborative filtering. And what this is, in its most basic form, is given some collection of items, say Spotify's song library, and it calculates the similar, like which items are similar to what other items in that collection. It then recommends you an item if you've shown interest in a similar item. So in this example, Bob has listened to song one. We know that song one is similar to song two, so Bob's pretty likely to listen to song two. In reality, these recommendation algorithms are much more complex and deep learning makes up only a very small part of the overall system. So, for example, at Spotify, when given a playlist of your favourite songs, they want to be able to predict the next song to join that playlist. Spotify utilises a particular kind of the neural networks that I mentioned earlier. And these are called recurrent neural networks, RNN for short. And when given a sequence of items, the RNN tries to predict which, which will be the next item in that sequence. So Netflix is, was pretty serious about the same recommendation, and so much so that back in 2006, they launched this competition called the Netflix Prize. And this competition offered a $1 million cash prize to the people who could come up with the, the best algorithm that predicted the user ratings on their movie, on their movie sorry, most accurately. So they, can, they closed that competition about three years later, and the prize was awarded to a team whose final algorithm used a combination of about 100 different techniques to predict user ratings. This team and another leading team used another new kind of neural network called restricted Boltzmann machines, RBMs. RBMs were one of the few early techniques in collaborative filtering that allowed 
um, the collaborative filtering algorithm to handle large data sets. And given that Netflix's um, database had over 100 million user ratings, this was super important to them. So moving on to computer vision, cats versus dogs. How many people in this room think the image on the left is a cat and the image on the right is a dog? <laughs> cool. I think most of you know what cats are and dogs are. Like at this point, I hope you know what cats and dogs are. Alright. So about 10 years ago, people thought computers weren't very good at seeing things. So, so much so that this cat versus dog classification task was actually used um, as something called a catcher. A catcher pretty much um, is just a little test that websites use to check if you're a human or a computer. I'm sure most of you have interacted with one before. <laughs> the idea behind this capture was that um, a user had to correctly identify the cats and dogs in 12 <coughs> images to pass. Now, this is back in 2007, and at the time that this capture was proposed, the people that proposed it thought that machines only had a 1 in 54,000 chance of solving it. That's about 0.00001%, which is very close to zero. Now, unfortunately for them, exactly about a year later, a team from Stanford University managed to increase that probability from 1 in 54,000 to 1 in 10, 10%. That's an improvement of a massive 10,000 times, with an 80% accuracy of classifying each image on its own correctly. <coughs> And the way this new algorithm works, a recognition project that now powers that feature on Facebook that automatically tags your friends when you upload photos. At its release, um, Deep Face was about 97% accurate, and I have no doubt that it has only increased since then. 97% is very, very close to human accuracy. And Deep Face was so successful at its launch that its algorithm was actually more powerful than the FBI's facial recognition algorithm. The FBI's clocked in only at a measly 85% accurate. So moving on to AI's playing games. Some of you may have heard about Google's AlphaGo AI. Um, and that AI beat one of the world's top Go players, Lee Say Dolls, back in March. Mr. Lee was beaten soundly with a 4-1 um, in a spectacular five-game series. Now, this was a huge deal at the time, um, because this is the first time a computer program had beaten a human, professional human player in the game Go. Go has traditionally been a really difficult game for, com for computers to play, because of the complex nature of the game. To give you an idea of how complex Go is, there are more possible positions in the game Go than there are positions in the universe. Now, this isn't the first time a computer has beaten a professional human in a relatively complex game. Back in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue chess program actually beat world chess champion Gary Kasparov. And it did this by searching at each point in the game every possible move and then choosing the most optimal one. Now, a Google is a massive number. It's number one followed by a hundred zeros. And Go is one Google times more complex than chess. If we were to use the same technique for Go as we did, as Deep Blue did for chess, um, it would probably take <coughs> us a million, maybe a billion years of computational time. So, how did AlphaGo overcome this complexity obstacles? Well, by using neural networks. So AlphaGo was trained in three stages. In the first stage, researchers train a neural network on about 30 million expert human Go moves. And this neural network's aim was to predict the next human move, and they did this until it was about 57% accurate. Now, it's no use being able to mimic human if you want to beat them. So, they then taught AlphaGo how to generate new strategies and new moves by having it play itself thousands upon thousands of times with different strategies each time. Finally, AlphaGo was taught to assess the quality of each strategy at each position in the game by looking at the likelihood of winning of that strategy. As a result, AlphaGo is optimised for winning games and they will, it will always choose the strategy with the lowest likelihood of winning. Now this is really interesting. When we compare this to common human strategies, we find that human strategies often favour winning with a higher point margin between players even when the plays are risky. Perhaps you could read into this uh, philosophically, computers aren't slaves to the same emotions as we are. Great. 
So to finish off this talk, <laughs> I'd like to discuss one more AI technology, the robot. And we're going to discuss, the one we're going to discuss today is the classic T-800 Model 101 from the Terminator thing. Yes. What would it take for us to create the Terminator? So robotic body aside, the Terminator is one crazy piece of AI. In the Terminator 2, the Terminator states, the more contact of humans I have, the more I learn. Now, what does this actually mean? So, the human, uh, the Terminator is able to converse naturally with humans. You could be talking to the Terminator, you wouldn't know that it's a robot. It can imitate the voices of humans, and it can even read human emotions. Um, physically, uh, the Terminator can run around, it can avoid obstacles, it can shoot a variety of weapons, it can drive a tanker, and any, many other vehicles. Interestingly, the Terminator also learns to sweat, as well as learning his now favorite catchphrase, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> So the Terminator being so skilled at so many things um, means it's a great example of something called strong AI. Strong AI is AI which has intelligence equivalent to a human being. All the technology we've discussed today, recommendation, computer vision, and gameplay, are examples of weak AI. And that's where AI is taught to focus on one specific task. To put this in perspective, we humans have only just taught machines to do specific tasks well let alone better than other humans. For us to create the Terminator, we would actually need to be able to teach an AI thousands upon thousands of single human tasks that we take for granted every day, and to a level where it could be better than humans. There are currently too many problems in AI that need to be solved before this can happen, unfortunately. Considering how little progress we've made so far, the possibility of sentient robots arriving in the new future to kill us all is pretty unlikely. For example, bipedal motion. That is, walking on two legs, right? And that's something robots do really poorly. We do this all the time without even thinking about it. Researchers tried to make the best bipedal robot at the DARPA Robotics Challenge last year. Now, DARPA is the US government's uh, military research center. Every year they hold this robotics competition so that um, the world's best and most expensive robots can be showcased and can verse each other. I'd like to show you this short video to emphasize <laughs> how difficult robots find to do something that we don't have without even thinking. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, questions and answers. Yeah. We have one over there. So, so the big thing with artificial intelligence is this still seems to be this like need for humans to almost start the process. And there's still this, this huge part of human interaction to get it going. From there, things seem to be able to kind of, you know, it's got that neuro kind of capability to go from there. So, like, you know, what start from the beginning? Of the so, so that's kind of like that weak AI versus strong AI thing we talked about earlier. Um, for machines to be able to decide, you know what, I'm going to learn how to hack your passwords tomorrow, it's going to be at a level where it's got that human intelligence. But I guess like it's interesting because that always brings in a philosophical part of it, and that is like, is does being intelligent mean you can like have your, does that mean sentience really? And and I think. I'm not, I don't think I am qualified to answer that question, but that's certainly something you have to answer. Because even if we make computers super intelligent, so that's the level beyond strong AI, where they're more intelligent than us, that doesn't necessarily mean they're sentient. So I guess it comes down to that. Sentience, is that the same as intelligence? Couldn't you say that all you need to do is teach AI how to learn by that one skill and everything else kind of? Yeah, that's true. Um, and it's interesting because in teaching AIs to learn, um, there's, a, uh, there's this huge push at the moment to teach. Um, I know Elon, Elon Musk really supports this idea of uh, teaching machines to learn, but also teaching them to learn morals. And that's like, you know, when, you, when you're a kid, you learn that like you, you were sad because some kid hurt you, so you're unlikely to go and hurt that other kid. Well. A lot of people think that it's really important to teach machines that as well when they're learning, teaching them to learn new skills because if we don't do that, then it's quite likely we will end up machines that will have some singular focus, say, um, making paper clips. And the machine might just be like, all right, my goal is to make paper clips, I will learn all the skills I need to make these paper clips. Now, the machine ends up spitting out lots of paper clips, it optimizes the factory, and then it's like, well, I want to make more paper clips. I'm going to hack my neighbor's factory. And, and, and make more paper clips. So the machine does that because it's learned to do things. And then after a while, once it's taken over all the factories in the world making paper clips, it can then go, well, it needs some more resources. There's not enough metal for me to make these paper clips. So what if it then mines all the resources? What are we going to do? So in that sense, it's really important for us to teach this AI, cool, your job is to make paper clips, but you shouldn't hurt people or hurt other systems along the way. So, I guess that's a thing that could happen, but if we balance that out with teaching machines ethics, then maybe we won't end up in a universe full of paper clips. <laughs> <laughs> what could be wrong? Yeah. 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 What do you mean? <coughs> well, I mean, the teacher's <laughs> comment, you know, if we're hoping that um, we only use it for good, not evil, uh, what could get wrong? <laughs> Many things, I guess. Um, I mean, if you guys have seen, I think, The Avengers 2 or 3, uh, Rise of Ultron, like, that's what's going on. We can create like, um, We can create things like the Terminator. I guess, like, a lot could go wrong, but we need to, like, I guess we need to put faith in the people to live, uh, designing and creating these things if they won't be terrible humans. So, I mean, currently, um, it's really interesting because I think in Japan, they've started to create sex bots. And they actually want to pass some laws to make it illegal to, um, what's the word, uh, take advantage of robots um, for like you know, sex and, and other things. You can't enslave robots. So I think um, legally it's, it becomes very interesting as well. So hopefully humanity learns to regulate itself. To what extent are these in play out in the of this car? So what I was talking about before, um, computer vision. So um, when I when I was a student, my supervisor was actually um, doing something where it did object recognition in video. So the things I showed was like object recognition and static images. But when you do object recognition in video, that's when you start getting into things like driverless cars because they've got to be able to constantly be observing the, the world around them and knowing what those things are. Um, so yes, it's definitely in use um, with uh, driverless cars. Probably a terrible question for this forum, but like your your standard uh, Bayesian algorithm, like a spam filter, has a big problem with overlearning, mm -hmm. right? How how does like your neural network deal with that kind of problem? Sure. So that's like the term um, they use in uh, AI for that's called overfitting, and that's when like given a data set, your 
your AI or whatever you're using learns it so well that it starts to describe random noise <coughs> and outlier cases in that particular data set. A good model of a data set, so like a good neural network or a good Bayesian network, whatever you want to use, is able to generalize the data set well without describing random noise. And there are many techniques you can use to do that. Like one thing people use is they cut their data sets into bits and they train the model on one part and then test the, whether the model is good on this other part of the data it hasn't seen before. And that seems to work fairly well in having the AI not super gen generalize one set of data. So just um, on the back of that question, so how important is it to have a proper data set before you feed it into it? So does that mean you have to do some preparatory work before you feed yeah. the input into it? Yeah, so like um, the particular technique I've talked about, they call it n-fold segmentation. And so what would happen is given a set of data, we might, if we had a five-fold, what would we do is we would create five um, variations, five copies of this data set. And er in every single um, of those five variations, we take out a little bit from that variation and hide it. So we then train that model on each of the little variations. And on each of the variations, it then tests itself on the unseen data. Um, so that's one way to prepare um, data. Um, interestingly, the DeepFace project that I mentioned before with Facebook, um, they were able to get that thing to be so accurate purely because of the volume of data they had access to. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was maybe like five years ago. They, if you logged into Facebook, it would be like, hey, we think you're a dodgy person. Can you recognize your friends in these photos? And really, they were gathering data for their like, little project. So volume of data and quality of data definitely makes a huge difference in training. Uh, any more questions? No, that's it. All right.